السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ نحمد و نسلی علیہ رسول الکریم اما بعد فاعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ویلکم یو آل ٹو دا پروگرام انڈرسٹینڈنگ قرآن دا ورڈ آف اللہ یسٹرڈے وی ٹاکٹ اباؤٹ دا فرسٹ جوز وی اسٹارٹیڈ وتھ سر الفاتحہ اینڈ وی بگین وتھ دا بیسک کانسیپٹس دیٹ ور دیر ان سر البقرہ We finished off on the verses where uh, Ibrahim salam, was making this marvelous dua while building the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kaaba. And what he was doing was he was facing Qibla and he was making dua where he was, he wished a lot of goodness, a lot of khair, not only for himself and his successive generations, his progeny. So in this surah, As we, as we begin the second juz, we talk about the Qibla and the importance of facing the house of Allah during our prayer. The verses say, it's Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 142. سَيَقُولُ الصُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَاللَّهُمْ أَنْ قِبْلَتِهُمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا قُلِ اللَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ يَحْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَى سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ The foolish will ask, Why did they turn away from the Qibla towards which they used to face? O Muhammad sallam, say, East and West belong to Allah. He guides whomever he wishes to the right way. Let me give you a little background into this. Uh, because Muslims, when the Ibrahim salam, had built Kaaba and all the people in uh, the Arab Peninsula, they used to face Qibla in their uh, worship. When Rasulullah the Prophet moved, migrated to Medina, and in Medina for 16 months, he was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to face Jerusalem. That was the focus of worship for the Jews. So there was a lot of um, um, activity and the rumors and ridicule which was around by people towards the Muslims. They were already being persecuted, but at this point they were asked If you have a different identity, then how come you are facing sometimes uh, Kaaba and sometimes you are facing Jerusalem, the Baitul Maqdis? And the Muslims, they were basically following the commandments that were coming to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after 16 months, they were again given this commandment to face back the Qibla. Basically, this was sort of a public announcement, a social announcement of shift of leadership from Bani Israel to Rasulullah to Bani Ismail. And that is what we need to establish over here when it says, the foolish will ask you, why did they turn away from the Qibla? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, change management is always difficult. Even in these times, whenever there is a change in the organization, there is change in the system, people take time to accept it. So for us, the test is, whenever there is a command coming from our Creator, our Lord, how do we take it? And the Prophet وسلم, and the, his companions set a beautiful example. In the narration we find out, when these verses were being revealed, the Prophet was had in a prayer with his companions. And if you look at the map, the Kaaba, the Baitul Maqdis and Baitul Allah, they are in to- total opposite direction. And when the commandments came down, they were revealed, Rasulullah during his prayer moved from one position to totally opposite uh, position. And the companions, they immediately changed during their prayer. It was a marvelous display of discipline at that moment. The verses move on by telling us, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةٍ وَسَطًا And we have made you a moderate ummah. Now, with the change of Qibla, with the change of the direction, now the leadership has been announced publicly to going to the Muslim. And remember, this uh, Qibla is a means to end. And what is that end? To obey the Lord, obey the Creator who has granted us so many blessings. And the sixth, second important message that we are getting in the second juice is, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَسَطًا We have made you into a balanced nation. You look around at the Muslims today and they are fra- framed as extremist, illogical, and many of the things that they follow, people around talk about it and they are not able to place them that why they are at these extreme poles. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here is calling Muslims not extremists, but moderate. We should have sense of pride and honor 
with, after reading this verse. Why? Because uh, this religion is about balance. And in today's Jews, we will see the balance in so many activities that we do and so many commandments that we follow. And basically, we, should, uh, we have been told that now that the leadership is with you, everyone is focusing on the Muslims and their practices and their spirituality and their rituals. So what you need to have in your life is don't take Islam as a burden, but practice and see, look at the beauty of Islam. And basically, when we talk about Islam and we talk about the beauty of Islam and the balance that is there in Islam, we need to feel calm and we need to feel well grounded and also motivated. So in these verses, later on, when we keep talking about it, we find that we have been told about many balances. Um, in this balance, we find out uh, there is talk of Fasta Bikul Khairat, which is a verse 148, that you know what you need to do? Rush towards good deeds and take it as a central point of your life, that in any given situation, you have to see what is the best deal that I get out of it and where I need to invest. Then as we move on to verse number 152, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, فَاسْكُرُونِي أَسْكُرُكُمْ Therefore remember me and I will remember you. وَاشْكُرُولِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ And do not and be grateful to me and never deny me. One important way in which we can have this balance is that once we develop this connection with the Creator, we start developing uh, gratitude in our life because these are the two elements which come in automatically together and they are very well placed with each other. Then we moved on to another element in verse number 153. <laughs> Inna Allaha ma'as sabirin. O who you believe, seek my help with the patience and prayer. Surely Allah is with those who are doing sabr. So now the triad is complete for us. How to strike the balance being the Muslim, being in this leadership role. The, the triad starts with remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, developing connection with him formally and informally. And inshallah throughout Quran, we will be learning different ways how we work on this relationship. Second important thing, having gratitude in your life. Because the moment you have gratitude, you become productive. You become a positive person. And the third element is having patience, which in these times we say, be emotionally intelligent. Have emotional control in yourself. So through this triad, what we are going to achieve is something we would enjoy and we would cherish as well. But wait a minute, the moment we start working on this triad, is it our life going to be very smooth, very happy, and uh, we will not have any hurdles? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us over here, 155 verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second juz in chapter number two. And we will surely test you you're steadfast, if you're steadfast, if you're doing sabr, how? Through fear, through drought, through loss of property, through loss of life, through loss of produce, and give glad tidings to those people who are patient, who do sabr. That means the moment you say, I am going to follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to be part of this ummah. I'm going to work on my gratitude and my patience. I'm going to develop my connection with uh, the creator. The next step, the test will be there. Like you take un admission in any university or you try to take any intensive course, you will have a lot of exams. You will go through a big process of channelizing yourself. So the tests are always going to be there. And that is why we have been told What's the balance over here? What would a person belonging to Ummat -e Wasat would do? We will say in any sort of calamity or any sort of test in life, we, we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. And that is when we feel um, there are no regrets in our life. We feel we are holding on to a purpose and also meaning. So balance is not something that you find, but balance is something that you create for yourself. In verse number 158, immediately when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how we need to groom ourselves, develop ourselves, immediately comes up the verse about Safa and Marwa. 
This is one of the ritual that we perform in the times of Hajj. And in the Hajj, in this place is a story of the sabr and patience and shukr and of the connection of a lady that is Hajra. And what she did was she was there with her baby and she was going from one mountain hilltop to another hilltop and she was trying to find some water uh, for the baby. So that is a connection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, acknowledging the efforts that were made by the lady in those times. And that is why we move on with all other messages. And Allah Ta'ala says, you know, one of the balance that you need to have in your life, which is given out to us in verse number 165 in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse juice number two. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says over here, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ There are those who worship other deities besides Allah and they love them as they should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here comes the important message for us, how to strike the balance, how to strike the balance in the different things we love around us, our passions, our, our um, desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us over here, وَلَزِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ the people who are the believers, their love is the strongest for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, this is like the balance we need to have. Like, you know, when someone is in love, what do they do? They're constantly thinking about their lover. Um, they like to do everything that will please their lover. And at the same time, they're in total trance. So this is the kind of relationship we need to have with our creator, thinking about him, during the rituals and outside the rituals as well. And also in everything that we do, we need to keep questioning ourselves. Would this please uh, the creator? Would this please my Lord? And yes, should be in awe about our relationship as a Muslim, as a believer. Then the balance moves on to another aspect of our life. Ya Yuhannas. What do you do, O mankind? You have to focus on what you eat and how you spend your time. So in the eating manners, we have been told in verse number 172. O believers, eat the clean things, eat the tayyib things, which we have provided to you, and give thanks to Allah if you worship only Him. Look at the marvelous way the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the creator is telling us to groom ourselves in all aspects of life. Because the concept sometimes that we carry is either you are only focused on your ibadah, the rituals, or you're only focused on your worldly success. But the balance in life is not just about the time management, but the boundary setting that we maintain for ourselves. And yes, making the right choices in that boundary and uh, enjoying those choices. Then again, more balances over here, and the balance now starts with the social laws which should be in our life. One of the social laws that Allah subhanahu wa talks about in verse number 178 is the law of qisas. If, if there is a criminal, if someone has killed someone, then what, how we should be dealing with them. And we should not be putting them away in the jails so that they, they were uh, engaged in minor thefts and ultimately they come out as more professional criminals. No, take them to the court and write there and then decide for them according to the law that has been given in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then come the verses about fasting, which you have already covered. And then comes the verses about how we connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through dua. Many times I've seen people when they talk about dua, supplication, they say it's like cognitive behavior therapy. It's like your frame of mind. You know, when you're making dua, when you're, when you're asking any help or seeking anything from your Lord, your creator, basically you are programming your mind towards it. Some people, they totally deny the concept of dua. They say, I'm self-made. I'm going to make things happen in my life. Well, the reality is we are really dependent on this dua. And there is something beyond this mindset which is related to the dua. That is why in verse number 186, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us an uh, important principle. Wa is a sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. Ujibu da'awata da'i is a da'an. Fal yastajibuli wal yu'minu bi la allahum yarshidun. 
When my servant questions you about me, tell them that I'm very close to them. I answer the prayer of every suppliant when he calls on me. Therefore, you should respond to, therefore they should respond to me and put their trust in me so that they may be rightly guided. So the dialogues that sometimes you hear from people or sometimes you hear in some drama when people are going through difficult times, uh, where is Allah? And Nauzubillah, why is he not responding to my call? Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will always respond to your call. Just have the right focus. So for making dua, what we need to do is, first of all, stop sinning. And the second important thing what we do is have very firm and staunch belief. When I make dua for something which is right, appropriate, and I'm not trying to harm anyone else, inshallah, my creator, my Lord, will give me everything. And then what we do need to do is understand how the duas or the supplications that we make are accepted. Number one, I have made a dua, he will grant me or he can grant me immediately. Number two, he will grant me, but maybe not immediately, maybe sometimes in my life when he feels it's appropriate for me. Number three, what can happen is there is a calamity coming my way. I'm going to be going through a difficult test. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes that test from my life, doesn't give me what I'm asking for, but at least that test is gone. Number four, he might not grant me anything in this life, but in the hereafter, I get piles and loads of goodness. And according to a hadith in which the just says, that when the people will get all those loads, they will ask Allah, oh Lord, what did I do to get all these blessings? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell them, you made a dua in your life, and it was not granted to you, but it had been saved for you in the hereafter. And those people at that moment would say, I wish none of my supplication, none of my duas had been accepted in that life, and I would have gotten everything over here. So basically, the reassurance has to be with us that all my duas are going to be inshallah accepted. What I need to do is have the focus, have dua, and also feel Allah's presence. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I am qareeb, I'm just very near to you, I'm just very close to you, so we need to feel his presence. Remember, he's not physically present everywhere. He's present with us through his knowledge, and he is at, his, at a level much higher than us on his throne. And then there is another balance that has been given to us in the verse where the relationship between husband and wife has been explained. Husband wife need to look at each other, not like lovebirds, but like the people where they help each other, and like we adorn ourselves with our dresses and we beautify ourselves with our dresses. How we get up in the morning and we feel, I need to look at my best with my dress. So the relationship between husband and wife is like that. You look at each other as you are incomplete without each other and you compliment each other and we need to respect each other. So a beautiful relationship over here has been described. And in this balance, certain boundary has also been set up. Tilka hududullah, fala taqrabuha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these are the limits set by Allah. So do not try to violate them. Why? Because violating such, uh, um, um, such boundaries are only going to bring problems and troubles in our life. Then we move on. Again, the balance in our ibadah, our rituals have also been mentioned over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about hajj, how you should be performing hajj, and what are the different rituals which are related to that. There is also mentioned in these verses another beautiful dua, which is in verse number 208. And this is a dua that we also need to understand, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says over here that there are people, famine and nas, there are people among, there are people, what do they do? Man yaqulu, and they make a dua over there, Rabbana atina fid dunya. Oh Allah, give me a share in this world, give me abundance in this life. And such are the people who will not have any share in the hereafter. You would see people who would be going for hajj or even in their personal life. And like also in Ramadan, we keep, keep making duas for grades 
for shadi, marriage, and then for our career choices, then for our job, then if someone is uh, going around building a house, so they're making du'as for that. So there are only du'as which are focused on the worldly affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you're making a supplication and that du'a is only focused on the worldly affair, that is all you're going to get. But then he moves on by telling us, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُوا And among them there are those who say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَزَابَ النَّارِ O oh, our Lord, give us good life both in this world and in the hereafter and save us from the torment of the fire. This is, this is one beautiful dua that we need to make. And it, um, it basically covers three important elements. Number one, we want the best in this life. And that is one dua that we need to make. This is part of being moderate. You don't uh, just uh, give out all the beauties and all the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in this life. Second dua, we say, Allah ta'ala, I also want the best in hereafter. And third dua, oh Allah, I don't want to be in the hellfire. So these are the three components that we need to focus on in our dua. And again, that is the balance and the beauty that we understand. Another balance that we talk about is that how we need to be staying in the boundary where in verse number 208, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya yuhallazina amanu, O believers, O dukhulu fi silmi kafa, enter into Islam fully. How do you do that? We will talk about it after a short break. <laughs> Welcome back. We were talking about Jews 2, um, Surah Al-Baqarah, and I finished off on verse number 208, where I was telling you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells all the believers, Udkhulu fi silmi kafa, enter into Islam fully. Why? This is an important concept to understand. When we are doing pick and choose, when we are following some things and then we are not con uh, convinced about other things, that is not going to bring balance in our life. We will be always swaying in one direction or the other. That is why it is important that uh, what we need to do is that um, we hold on to those things which are important and we let go of those things which are not important and the balance should tell us when to what to hold on to when to hold on to when to let go of different things so don't be sailing in two boats you're always going to be confused if you tell yourself i'm a believer let me try to practice all the things and let me find ways how i can accommodate myself in the worldly matters as well as for my spirituality then um, again we find out that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks about uh, the balance in uh, the uh, in in our those areas where like addictive patterns like in verse number 219 uh, we find out the mention is uh, there's a warning which is beginning by telling us that uh, we need to be staying away from the gambling and also drinking the alcohol this is the first commandment which has been given over here and this is like with a subtle hint that please stay away from it yes there is a benefit in it but uh, there is sin and with this sin, you are going to destroy your life. Because many times when people say, listen, this is mentioned in Quran that um, the gambling and the drinking, it has benefits. So that's why if there is a kid who is having a flu, so rather than giving him something which, is, uh, which has been described by a doctor or uh, is there in the tibbi nabwi, in the medication uh, pattern that has been given to us by the Prophet Wasallam, I'm going to go for brandy. So please make sure that it is a sin which has been mentioned over here and stay away from all those areas. Then the women and the husband-wife relationship has been mentioned over here. And again, repeatedly, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the people, the believers, that you need to strike a balance in your relationship with your wife. You need to have the right focus while you're entering into the marriage. Marriage is about developing good relationship, respectable relationship. Marriage is not about finding a spouse who could be a millionaire at both ends or who could be having killer looks. Marriage is about building the families and those people who focus on building the families, that's when there is stability, there is the families are able to perform at peak level. 
And that is why in verse number 229, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gives us uh, uh, the, the solution if someone needs to walk out of the marriage or uh, issues when you have within the marriage, the, the divorce has been mentioned over here. At-talaqu marratan. Usually what we see in, uh, in our society around, and especially when you watch certain movies or you watch certain dramas, what we see is there is a husband wife who are in dispute. The husband gets angry and he goes talaq, talaq, talaq. He says divorce, divorce, divorce. And then there is a, usually thunder and then there is rain and this woman, she's, this woman is feeling lost and suddenly she is out of house with nothing to do. And she, her whole life pattern is shattered. Now this would this might look very nice and uh, very emotional element while you're watching a certain play or a serial. But what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us even about divorce is there is balance in it. What's the balance? At-talaqu marratan. The the divorce is only allowed twice. That means uh, if a husband says divorce, I divorce you, then the woman is not supposed to leave the house. She stays over there for that time period and she tries to beautify herself. She tries to reconcile with him and um, he might also be regretting his decision and they try to make sure to have that marriage workable for themselves, for their children, for their families, for the society, for the betterment of that. If he divorces her again, she will go through the same process, not because she has to suffer, not because she has to take all the abuse, but no, to safeguard the marriage for his sake and her sake and the sake of her dear children. But if he divorces her after the third time, then she is going to leave the house. And then the rulings later on applies over there. So again, the balance is to save the marriage. Many a times in our society, we see people who go through this emotional element of divorce and later on they regret. And later on what they're doing is they're looking for loopholes to come back in the same marriage or be with the, with the, the person whom they have divorced. So that is why emotional stability, the balance in life has to come through uh, all these elements. And, and even if the, there is this uh, scene of divorce, like in our society, we see divorce as a very ugly picture. Um, everyone is so unhappy and there is a lot of um, blame game going on. Everyone is trying to prove their innocence and everyone is trying to prove that the other person is a bigger sinner. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all this ordeal, it keeps telling us in these verses repeatedly that you have to be nice to each other. You have to handle all these matters in a very beautiful manner. Similarly, if the children are over there and if there is a children, if there's a baby who needs the mother, there is an advice which has been given to the father or the husband that you need to take care of this wife, even if you're divorcing her, provide her with some um, money and sustenance and some material so that she can take care of the child for you. Similarly, the woman has been told, do not blackmail your husband just because you are taking care of the child in that time frame. These are the beautiful messages that have been given to us so that we develop tolerance in these relationships and we come up with the right picture or the right status that should be there. Then we come up with, towards the very end of this juice, we come up with the story. Uh, and this is the story in which um, we have been told about Dawud salam, who was uh, a part of an army at that moment. And uh, they were fighting up their enemy. And again, the balance have been told to them that even when you're going on a battlefield expedition, you know what you're supposed to do? They were warned, the people were warned over there not to drink from the river which was flowing very close to them, but just few sips to quench their thirst. And many of the soldiers at that time, what they did was they filled up uh, uh, and took a lot of water and they never followed the commandment which was given to them. And then it was difficult for them to fight their enemy. And the people who fought the enemy, again, a very beautiful dua was uh, told to them. And this is a dua that we all need to make, again, because if we want to strike this balance of the triad, the zikr, remembering Allah, the gratitude, shukr, and the patience, sabr in our life. The dua is, which is in um, verse number 250 in Surah Al-Baqarah, ربنا أفرق علينا صبرا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين. O Rabb, fill our hearts with steadfastness, with sabr. 
make our steps firm and give us and, and help us against the unbelievers. I find this dua so much important in our life. Sometimes I come across mothers who are like going crazy, taking care of their children, like a four-year child or 10-year child or even a teenager. Sometimes I come across ladies uh, who are not able to build a relationship with their in-laws or even they are having problem with their own family members, even with the husband, and they're like, I don't know how to maintain my relationship. I, I try to fix myself. I try I achieve certain milestones. And then I again go back to my default. So I always tell them, make a dua like this. This is such a beautiful dua. It says, Rabbana afriq alayna sabran. Oh Allah, shower, give me a, in a sabr in abundance. This is something we need to understand. Whenever we say, I'm not able to have patience, I don't know why I'm so impulsive, you need to make dua for that. Because the moment you get, make this dua, inshallah you'll get help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, then you also repeatedly give yourself this motivational message that rather than getting impulsive, I have to work on my sabr. And then, wasabbit aqdamana, I want to be steadfast. This is an important thing because many times we, we attend a certain session, we get motivated by someone who is guiding us, and then, as I said, we go back to default. We are not steadfast. We don't have a steady pace of following certain things. So we're here, again in this dua, we have been told that we need to be steadfast. If we practice something, take baby steps, don't try to go for giant leaps, but accomplish something in your, la in, in your life. And then, وَنْصُرْنَا لِلْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ And please help us against the unbelievers. Worldwide, we see that our ummah is suffering, not because of the external conspiracies. Yes, there are conspiracies around. The conspiracies have always been around in the lives of the Prophet ﷺ as well. But how did he find these conspiracies? He never indulged into these conspiracies. What he did was he focused on having balance in his life. And that is the beauty. That is why he has been given to us as a role model. Because whenever we look at him as a role model, that is when we try to understand where to strike the balance in our life. Um, and similarly, we find out that like in Surah, uh, in the same uh, juice, on, uh, in this uh, verse number 216, we have again been told another criterion how we can attain this patience and gratitude in our life. The verse says, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ It is quite possible that something which you don't like is good for you. And then, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ And there is, it is possible that there is something that you love and it is bad for you. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah knows and you do not know. And we do experience that. Sometimes we, we liked something, we wanted something, we were very passionate about it, and we got it, and ultimately it brought in a package of problems, difficulties, hurdles, and even sometimes it harms us one way or the other. So what we need to do is sometimes we just need to step outside whatever we are trying to achieve, get some fresh air, remind ourselves of who we are, and then try to see what we actually want to achieve in life. Remember this beauty of uh, the Quran, how it is guiding us and how it is grooming us towards being better in our life. So this is when we learn all these things. Let me give you a couple of reminders on this balance that uh, we, we are talking about. Because this kind of balance is uh, something that we need, we lack and we need. Um, I will go to back to verse number 177. Uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, and you can mark it, and you can also go back on it and read the details of this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us over here, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ Righteousness is not whether you turn your face towards east or west. As I told you, we have been talking about Qibla, focusing or praying towards the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, you need to focus over there, but at the very same time, that is not just the standard of righteousness. What is righteousness? Let's try to see that. 
ولكن البر من آمن بالله والجوم الآخر والملائكة والكتاب والنبيين but the righteousness is now we have been given a long list and you can have it as a checklist for yourself and also your family and you can keep looking at it throughout Ramadan and if you inshallah practice it in Ramadan Allah will help you and guide you and give you clarity even for the rest of 11 months so let's look at the list believe in Allah the last day the angels the books and the prophets and to spend the wealth out of love for him on relative and orphans and helpless and needy travelers and those who ask for uh, uh, taking care of the captives and to establish salah and to praise zakah and to fulfill promises when made and to be steadfast in distress and in adversity and the times of war sadaku. These are the people who are truthful. Wa ulaika humul muttaqun. And these are the people who are Allah conscious, who are pious, who have taqwa. This is like a beautiful checklist that have been given to us. So if we try to understand, I have talked repeatedly about balance, balance, balance. And I'm sure that at the end of the day, when you'll be looking at Jews too, you will be thinking, where is the balance in my life and how I can go about it? We need to have this sense of pride being Muslim Ummah, who is the balanced nation. And we need to guide people, tell people, Muslims and non-Muslims around to adopt this balance and look at the beauty of this balance. I can give you many examples of this balance. For example, you will look at the world and some of the people are so superstitious they're extremely superstitious. And then they have their long list of things that they do out of that superstitious nature. And then we have a, a group of people who are totally scientific. Everything has to go by the scientific procedure. If you look at the Muslim Ummah, and if when we study Quran, when we look at the life of the Prophet وسلم, we have been given this balance, moderation. The balance is you are moderate. The balance is you enjoy things in a beautiful manner and you get the best out of everything. In few areas, we are not told to be superstitious, but yes, we believe in unseen. And yes, in the other areas, we go by the logical things. And where we have to believe in unseen and where we have to apply our logic, everything has been explained in Quran. Similarly, we have been told to uh, follow theology at the same time have the blend of it with the law that has been given to us. So that means we have a belief system and at the same time we have the right practices. It's not like I say I believe in certain thing, but in my life I adopt a totally different pattern. Another important thing that we do is the balance that we see between the rituals and just being spiritual. Because sometimes people say my heart is clean, but I will do as I feel like doing. No, the balanced Muslim is going to say, my heart is clean, it has taqwa in it, it has love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it, and look at my practices. They are also according to Quran. Then uh, we also see the concept that our life, uh, the people live around with, especially if you look at capitalism. The capitalism tells us just this life, just focus on this life, just multiply this life. And there is no concept of hereafter. It's like you are dust and ashes later on. But for a Muslim, the balance is we have dunya and we have akhirah. The balance is we, we invest in this life. This life, this dunya is like tools for us. And when we invest in these tools, we get the best in the hereafter. That's the balance that we need to adopt. Then um, another way that we look at people, especially our youngsters, they have this YOLO uh, philosophy that they follow. You only live once. Well, I would say in a way, yes, we only live once in this life, but this is not the end. We have another life. We are moving on towards another life. That also brings positivity in our life because sometimes when you say, I only live in this life, and what do I do? I'm struggling, struggling, I have all the issues, I'm managing my life, and at the end of the day, that's it. Whatever I did, it's gone, it's dust and ashes, as I said, and nothing else to do. And imagine when you lose someone near and dear, and if you live with this concept, would there be balance in your life? You'll feel miserable thinking, I lost a near and dear one, my parent, my child, my spouse, my husband, my wife, what do I do? I am helpless. 
But the Islamic balance tells us, no, there is another life. You're moving towards that life. And when you move towards that life, uh, you can invest in that life. You will meet though everyone in that life. And if I lose someone, when I say, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'oon, say, everyone belongs to Allah and we'll all go over there. Similarly, I would try to do things that can still be an investment for my hereafter and also for the hereafter of that person. So um, with this body and soul concept, again, there is balance. We also find out that Islam has, gives us a balance of the, on the gender roles as well. This is so beautiful. There is a hierarchy that we follow uh, in Islam. Men have been given just one status above the women. Yeah, I know sometimes women get really upset about this concept. But again, the balance is there. Not 10 times, not 100 times. Not, they have not been told that women are slaves to you. No, just one status above. Why? So that they understand their responsibility in the home system. But if the female performs well in her ibadah, in her practices, in the job description that has been given to her, the balance is she is going to get equal amount of reward. It's not like a paycheck which is of the little quantity given to a female and of a high standard given to a male. So again, there is balance in all the gender roles. But yes, the domain of responsibilities have been described, elaborated. They are different because of the needs, their own needs and also the needs of the society and the family. We also find out there is a balance between taking revenge and forgiveness. Again, uh, we have not been told to turn the other cheek every single time. No, um, you have been given, we have been given uh, a standard to uh, follow something and a standard to forgiveness. So again, the balance. So the emotional balance is there, the family system balance is there. Uh, the the uh, the dealing the social dealing balances there even in the most worst situation we have been told to maintain ourselves in the most possible and the beautiful manner so when we say ummat e wasat we need to repeatedly remind ourselves we are the moderate nation we are the moderate nation and when we are the moderate nation you know what you are supposed to do we have to be performing the best thing the best possible practice that we have to perform. Now, with this, what we also understand is the concept of um, this, uh, the verse that I already told you about, verse number 155, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the test will be there. You will definitely be tested. I would like to talk a little bit about this verse because many times people say, when I became spiritual, when I tried to work on my relationship, with the Creator, suddenly a lot of tests started happening in my life. Things turned upside down and maybe I should be not getting too spiritual. So what's the concept over here? We need to understand the test will always be there. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَا نَبْلُوا وَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ You will definitely be tested. Definite test will be coming over there. So how do we deal with them? If you have a balanced life, if you feel yourself that I'm a ummat wasat, if you develop emotional control in your life, if you have gratitude in your life, if you know how to make these supplications, how to have balance in uh, seeking dunya, uh, the worldly affairs, and also looking at your hereafter, what basically will happen is that many things will start falling in the right place. So the balance that we have talked about the surah that it uh, tries to explain to us. Let us see, look at, or revise the key messages from Jews too. The most important learning outcome today is two important duas, two important supplication. And yes, uh, at the time of sahur and at the time of iftar, when you are uh, keeping the fast, when you're breaking the fast, when you are praying five times a day, when you are in taravi, when you are doing kamul lel, what you need to do is make these two duas, especially. You can make rest of the duas as well, and inshallah, you can highlight them. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina zaban nar. And the second dua, Rabbana afrigh alayna sabran. So what you're doing is you're completing your triad. And the key messages that we have learned is 
Try to transmit these values to people around you. Try to engage them in healthy activities in the month of Ramadan and tell them how they can bring gratitude and patience in their life. And yes, whenever you come across people who are tested, tell them tests will be there. We should not make dua that Allah, I have, I'm practicing everything so you can test me. No, we should always seek Allah's protection that no test come our way. But if there is a test which comes our way, what we need to do is we need to, uh, we need to uh, deal with those tests in the best possible manner. Similarly, what we have also been told, a part of this test is the shaitan is going to try to always keep us away from the balance. Remember in the first news we talked about that when Adam salam was in Jannah, that's what he told him. He was supposed to strike the balance by following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he told him to go near that tree. So shaitan is always going to tell us to do something which is not appropriate. So remembering taqwa and setting the limits which have been given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when we will be able to fulfill all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever you feel restless, whenever you feel that um, there is something I'm not able to maintain in my life, whenever you feel I'm not able to create a healthy experience in my life, that is what you need to opt for. And when people around me, they tell me, oh, I have seen someone who is praying, such a nasty person. I always tell them, maybe this is a person who is not able to strike the right balance. The learning outcome from that person should be that if there are people around us who are not giving us the picture of what Muslims should be like, let us take the first step. Let us be the, that person who can achieve those heights. So for us, the important thing is we understand the importance of Qibla which brings all Ummah towards one focus. And we also cherish the role of Ummah Wasid in everything that we practice. And if we start working on these messages, then inshallah, we will feel that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we'll be able to present the beautiful picture of Islam to the whole world. So I will leave you with this message and with the dua ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت الصميم الأليم وتوب علينا إنك أنت الطواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأهل بيته أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته